Good morning. Good morning. In this season of Easter tide, we start with our Easter greeting Christ is risen. Christ, Christ is, is risen, risen indeed. indeed. Welcome to Pilgrim Church on this beautiful day. We have a wonderful day in store and several wonderful days upcoming. We are so glad that you are here with us this morning, whether you have been here five times or a hundred times. We are glad that you are here with us this morning. Sarah, would you tell us some of our announcements today? Sure, we have a few special Sundays coming up. Um, May 12th is Children's Sunday, so the children are going to lead worship from the beginning to the end, pretty much. Um, May 19th is Confirmation Sunday, and um, on May 12th, we're going to present our graduating senior, Sydney, with a journal, and inside of the journal, we're going to put pages that have messages to Sydney or pictures or drawings, whatever you'd like to um, give to Sydney. Um, I will be collecting those today. I'm not going to be here next week, so if you bring it next week, please hand it to Pastor Reeby or um, you can put it in my mail slot in the mail room. Thanks, Sarah. We have a few other things going on too on May 5th, that is next Sunday, after the worship service and after a little bit of coffee hour, we will have a lunch for newcomers and for folks who just wanna know more about how Pilgrim Church works. Um, that will be upstairs and talk to me if you're coming, especially if you have a dietary restriction so that I can make sure we have you covered. Um, we would love to have you join us and we already have several RSVPs, so you will not be alone. Um, sometimes it can be like, hmm, if I say yes to this and then I'm all by myself, you won't be. There will be a bunch of people with us next week co-hosted by our new moderator, Jeff Beam. And speaking of the officers of the church, today at the end of the service, before the benediction, we're gonna have a five minute congregational meeting. It's gonna be so fast. The purpose of that meeting is to be in accordance with our bylaws and elect the officers of the church, as well as say a prayer for our church council members. So we will do that at the end of the service today. Uh, anyone, Everyone is invited to stay, and it really only will be five minutes. Members are allowed to vote. Finally, on May 18th, we have a magician coming. This is at 10 o'clock in the morning on Saturday, May 18th, and we have postcards in the back of the sanctuary so that you can invite your friends and neighbors. This is a fantastic all ages opportunity just to come and have fun in Pilgrim Hall. So please join us on that day. I think that might be all of the announcements. Do you think, Sarah? I think so. Okay, would you lead us in the next part? Um, please join me in the passing of the peace. Peace be with you. And also with you. Let us share the peace of Christ with one another.
to God's church that is in on Coolidge Avenue in Lexington. We are a community called to be God's people. You are called to be saints. Grace and peace to you from God, our creator, and from Jesus Christ. Our opening hymn today is Lift Up Your Hearts, Ye People, um, number 190. would you join me in this opening prayer? Jesus, in your name, the early church spread throughout the known world, and yet our ancestors in faith faced challenges and disagreements. As we learn about the early church, give us your wisdom for the challenges we face today. Grant us your peace for this time and place. Amen. Our first scripture reading comes from Acts chapter 18, verses 1 to 4. After this, Paul left Athens and went to Corinth. There he found a Jew named Achilla from Pontus, who had recently come to Italy with his wife Priscilla, because Claudius had ordered all Jews to live, leave Rome. Paul went to see them, and because he was of the same trade, he stayed with them and he, walked, he worked together. By trade, they were tent makers. Every Sabbath, he would argue in the synagogue and would try to convince the Jews and Greeks. You might remember from last week that we have a series of readings where we're pairing the, the history in the Acts of the Apostles with the letter of Paul to a particular community. And so our second reading today, it will not surprise you, is from Paul's letter to the church at Corinth. Just a few verses from this first chapter, listen for God's word to you. Now I appeal to you, brothers and sisters, by the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, that all of you be in agreement and that there be no divisions among you, but that you be knit together in the same mind and the same purpose. For it has been made clear to me by Chloe's people that there are quarrels among you, my brothers and sisters. 
What I mean is that each of you says, I belong to Paul, or I belong to Apollos, or I belong to Cephas, or I belong to Christ. Has Christ been divided? Was Paul crucified for you, or were you baptized in the name of Paul? I thank God that I baptized none of you except for Crispus and Gaius, so that no one can say you were baptized in my name. I did baptize also the households of Stephanias. Beyond that, I do not know whether I baptized anyone else. For Christ did not send me to baptize, but to proclaim the gospel and not with eloquent wisdom, so that the cross of Christ might not be emptied of its power. For the message about the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing, but to us who are being saved, it is the power of God. Here end the readings. Hear what the Spirit of God is saying to the church. Thanks be to God. Change in the program, so um, we're actually doing every valley, not by
Now the children can come with me and Izzy downstairs for a little bit more of children's Sunday prep. Friends, would you pray with me? Oh God, may the words of my mouth and the meditations of all our hearts together be always acceptable in your sight, for you are our strength and our redeemer. Amen. Chloe sent Paul a letter with concerns about her house church community and Paul wrote back. Every time we open the Bible to 1 Corinthians, we are opening someone else's mail. While we might not open the downstairs neighbor's credit card bill, when it comes to ancient history, reading other people's letters is valid. Ancient letters are considered primary source documents. But when we read these biblical letters, we've got to keep some important points in mind. Most importantly, we only have one side of the conversation. For whatever reason, Chloe's letters to Paul didn't survive. And not only that, but we don't even have all of the letters that Paul sent to Corinth. In the middle of this letter, he references his last letter, which we don't have. And on top of that, Paul probably did not think he was writing scripture or theology. He was just writing to Chloe and her people about specific events and conflicts that had come up in Corinth since Paul converted the first people to Jesus' way in the fifth decade of the first century. It's like, you know, your kid texts you and says, should I wear the blue shirt or the purple shirt? And you write back and say the purple shirt. And then 2,000 years later, people are saying you should only ever wear a purple shirt. Later Christians made this part of the Bible. But as I said last week, Acts and Paul's letters are the closest that we get to early church history. Reading other people's mail is the only way for us to connect with our ancestors in faith from the decades after Easter. And so we are not going to write return to sender addressee unknown on this envelope. This morning, because we do have a congregational meeting ahead of us, I wanna keep it brief and suggest that we might learn from this very first wisdom that Paul offers in this particular letter, a little bit about how we deal with things in the church today, because there is some relevance. Maybe there is even wisdom for how to deal with divisions in the church. Paul says, it has been made clear to me by Chloe's people, Chloe, the head of a household of Christians and leader in a church in Corinth, sent a letter to Paul. And while in Corinth, which was a wild ancient city, by the way, Paul had helped to establish multiple house churches that occasionally met together in a larger assembly. Chloe seems to have been one of the big leaders of this group. But after he left, there was trouble. Factions developed, people argued, people aligned themselves with different leaders. Paul, Peter, Apollos, Cephas means Peter, right? It's the same name. This was, of course, a completely unique situation in the history of religion. No community before or since has ever experienced internal division or struggle. Not a one, right? Never happened. No one in this room can relate to any of this. Can, okay, so now I have to say, I'm just gonna testify for a moment about how deeply grateful I am every single day when I wake up knowing that Pilgrim Church in 2024 is not a divided congregation. I mean, can I get an amen on that? Can I get another amen on that? 
This is like really good news. And still, every community, even when times are great, needs to remember the message that Paul sent to Corinth, and by the way, to several of the other churches that he wrote to along the way. The invitation and the work for Corinth, and to those of us reading their mail 2,000 years later, is to not let factions and divisions get in the way of faith, and to not let factions and divisions get in the way of faithful living. A lot of Paul's letters are to communities dealing with division, and he tries to re-center them on Christ. The good news of the cross, which more broadly means the good news of Jesus' birth and life and death and resurrection are profoundly and radically different from anything else that the world knew in that moment or knows today. The world, the world, Paul said, called them foolish to follow a Messiah that had been crucified and risen, but followers of the risen Christ find power in the Christ event. Paul is saying, it's not about me. I'm not in the center of this story. It's not about Apollos or Peter or any of the other gods worshiped in Corinth. It's about Christ. So Paul calls for an end to division and quarrels and fights. He says it to another church enduring conflict in this way. To the church at Ephesus, I beg you to walk in a manner worthy of the calling to which you have been called, with all humility and gentleness, with patience, bearing with one another in love, making every effort to maintain the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. There is one body and one Spirit, just as you were called to the one hope of your calling, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of us all, who is above all and through all and in all. Now Paul calls for unity. But there's something subtle here, because unity does not mean uniformity. Churches back then and churches today are full of folks who look different, speak differently, vote differently, who are bound up together nonetheless in a covenant of love. We don't have a mega identity or tribalism as the sociologists like to talk about today, but we have a community that is life-giving and world-healing. I was reminded by one of my students this week of what that looks like in the UCC. She wrote this in her final paper for our class and I asked her permission to quote her. So this is a quote from Joy Castro Weir. She says, when I first learned about the United Church of Christ, I questioned how a church that valued autonomy so highly could remain interconnected with itself and find the theological harmony necessary to stand strong and unified in the world. I see the unity of the UCC expressed on a profound scale in local churches' trust in the power of a covenant built simply on the foundation of expressing God's loving presence in our world. I see profound unity in the shared belief that there is a miraculously holy and loving dimension to this human existence, and that the life of Jesus Christ is our example for what is possible through this revelation. She goes on to say, crucially, I believe that there is great power and strength in the UCC belief that local communities are able to decide how this revelation of God's presence in the world will be communicated. And this mosaic of theological expression is not incidental, but foundational to the UCC. The whole paper was good. 
In other words, we don't have to be uniform in our practice or belief. We can center on Christ and live with one another in harmony and in love, or in the words of Paul to the Ephesians, in humility and gentleness and patience. Serving God and following Jesus in the world in a mosaic of theological expression. And that is something for us to continually strive for. May it always be so. Amen. Our response hymn is drawn from another of Paul's great ideas. It is the classic, In Christ There Is No East or West, number 394 in the Black Hymnal. We take a minute every week to gather the joys and the concerns of our community on this day. I hope, folks on the Zoom, that you are even now typing your joys and concerns into the chat. Oh. <laughs> um, are there joys in the room this day. I will start with the word tulips, because the tulips are amazing right now. Who else has a joy? Um, yesterday, my daughter Emily and son-in-law Gordon hosted a fundraiser for SYNGAP1, which is what Hadley um, is facing and it was a wonderful day the whole family was there and Hadley was just glowing and really enjoying the support and love of her family so that was a wonderful joy that's great thanks for sharing about that wonderful fundraiser yes. I'd like to say that I'm joyful for the thoughtfulness of pairing the hymns that follow the sermons you know, this was a perfect blending. In Christ there is no East or West after that wonderful sermon. And that happens all the time. Well, thank you, Chris. Um, we try, Dot and I work on trying to figure out our seasons and, uh, and scripture readings. I will also say we take, take uh, suggestions. So there, there's one that, you know, sometimes there's one that I just don't see and then someone suggests it and it's good. Thank you, Mary. I had a wonderful time yesterday afternoon cooking with Acadia for her confirmation, end of the confirmation project. It was a very special day. 
That's so great. And we have four amazing projects coming um, that you'll get to hear about on May 19th. So can't wait to share all of that. I'm going to come over to the Zoom for a second. David shares a joy that his two sisters visited from Kentucky this weekend. Good news there. There's a lot going on in the life of our congregation and in our world right now. I know about some of those things and I will say them um, and then come to you all. Miranda and Liz are remembering their grandma, Ruth, who passed away this week. So our prayers go out to Liz Mackey and everyone who uh, is remembering Grandma Ruth. We remember Peter, um, at, uh, a friend of Derek and Sandy's who passed away this week. We remember Peter and pray for his wife and their family after his passing from cancer. I want to lift up a prayer for the memory of Ian Taylor, Sergeant Ian Taylor, a Bilrica police officer who died on duty this weekend. Who else would you lift up today? I remember the death of uh, a very important and famous painter in Taiwan. His name is Oh Hao Nen. He died on April the 25th. Would you say his name one more time? Oh, oh Hao Nen. Thank you. Thank, you. Thank you for lifting up his memory this day. Please continue to pray for Meredith, who is facing Parkinson's, but the medicine is really helping her, and please help our family to support her. Thank you, Deborah. Lisa. Um, the people of Gaza. Thank you, Lisa, for lifting up uh, the people of Gaza on this day, and I have a little more to say on that in in a moment. Um, this week there's a lot to pray for in Israel and Gaza. Prayers for people of Gaza facing famine and disruption for families in Israel waiting for hostages to come home after six months. Prayers for a bilateral ceasefire. Prayers for what some are calling a sustainable calm. And prayers for every leader and every diplomat all around the world that they might put the well being of all people above their own gain. I want to lift up in prayer families who are sleeping on the floor of Logan Airport every night right now. This has been the case for months, and there have not been a lot of headlines around them, but there was a picture just yesterday of 20 or 30 families sleeping on the floor at Logan because there is no other shelter for them to go to. Folks on Zoom, I'm going to come over to you now. Yeah. 
Let's bring all our prayers before God. I'm going to share a prayer this day by Sherry Prestman, one of the officers of the United Church of Christ, a prayer for this moment of war and conflict and violence. Oh, Holy One, war and conflict grips so many places in our world. Violence and injustice surround us, leaving wounds that run deep. Grant to us your peace, which surpasses all understanding, but do not grant it without our own investment in the peace we desire. Compel us to work with you, to join with you in the steady work of building peace. Call us to be present with those besieged by war and consumed by conflict. Cause us to model in our own lives the things which make for peace. And bestow upon us, we pray, your ancient blessing. Blessed are the peacemakers as we walk in this precious path. Holy and loving God, you who know every hair of every human being's head, you who love each one of us, you who love each one of us even when we make enemies one of the other, You love each of us, your children. We pray that we might see the face of Christ in every person that we meet and in our neighbors all over the world. We pray for the people of Gaza. We pray for the people of Ukraine. We pray for the people, even the people who call themselves enemies. We pray for those who are wondering if their loved one hostage taken will ever come home. And we pray for the leaders that you would guide the world toward peace. And we remember, O God, all those who are grieving, all those who are anxious, all those who are sick. We remember Peter and pray for his wife, B and their family. We remember Grandma Ruth and pray for Liz and Miranda. We remember Sergeant Ian Taylor and pray for his family. We remember Ohan Yen, the artist in Taiwan, and pray for all who are remembering the beauty created by the artists around us. And we pray, God, for those who have no home to go to, including families in need of shelter in our own neighborhood. And for healing for those experiencing profound illness, for Meredith and anyone dealing with Parkinson's or related illnesses, 
We pray for Hadley getting stronger but still dealing with a troubling illness and for all who would surround her with love and strength and care. And God of love, we remember and give thanks for all of the blessings of our lives. From family visits and fundraisers and the joy of music sung together to cooking and learning and growing in faith, we give you thanks for it all. We give you thanks, O God, for we remember the words of Paul, that in all circumstances we should give thanks. We give thanks and we remember Christ who is our teacher and the center of our faith, and we remember and say aloud the words that he taught us, our creator who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. In reading the letters of Paul, I'm reminded that he invited people to bring their donations and send them into the central church in Jerusalem for the needs of the saints and the sick and the ones in need, and we do this too. Our morning offering will now be gratefully received. Bless these gifts, O God, and guide us to be of one mind and purpose as we minister in your name. Amen. 
We're going to sing the first two verses of Peace I Leave With You, My Friends, and then don't go anywhere because we're going to have a congregational meeting. seated. I'm going to call upon outgoing vice moderator Leslie to call our brief meeting to order and um, take care of our, our initial piece of business. Good morning. I would like to call this congregational meeting to order, uh, the purpose of which is to elect our or to confirm our new leadership team. So could we please have um, our new moderator, Jeff Beam, to come forward, our vice moderator. Yes, thank you, Jeff. Our vice moderator, Doug Johnston. Our clerk, Don Moyer. and our treasurer, Dave McClave. Oh, I think I'm supposed to ask you if we have a quorum. As outgoing clerk. As outgoing clerk. Okay, we have a quorum, that's good news. All right, sorry, I should have done that first, I believe. Uh, so this is our proposed wonderful leadership team. Thank you so much for agreeing to serve. Could I have a vote, please? All those in favor? Raise hands or say aye. All right, visually, that looks awesome. Any no's? Any abstentions? Wonderful. We have our new leadership team. Thank you very much. And then Rebe is going to take over the rest of the 
of, of the meeting. <laughs> thank you, Leslie. And thanks to all of our outgoing officers and council members um, who were so fantastic in this last year. Let's give a round of applause to everyone who is signing off. Yep. I like congregational meetings where the bulk of the time is spent applauding. Um, but I would also like to now uh, invite all of the current members of council to come forward to join our officers up here, and that would be Isabella, Sadna, Susan, and Susan, uh, and Susan. Am I, am I right about that? There's uh, um, no, just two. Um, and uh, Matt, if he is here, Matt Snipe. Uh, Duncan is out of the country right now, and Steve, come on forward. Uh, did I get all of that correct? Okay. Um, we, we have a couple of little questions for our officers and our council members, um, and I will give you the response uh, so you don't have to have anything memorized. Council members and officers, you have been called by God and chosen by the people of God for leadership in this church. This ministry is a blessing and a serious responsibility. It recognizes your special gifts and calls you to work among us and for us. In love, we thank you for accepting your obligation, and we challenge you to offer your best to God, to this people, and to our ministry in the world. So today we install you, our officers and church council for this coming year, asking you, will you devote yourself to the service of God in the world? If so, please say, I will. Will you so live that you enable this church to be a people of love and peace? If so, please say, I will. Will you do all in your power to be responsible to the task which you have been chosen to do? If so, please say, I will. Let us be in a spirit of prayer. Almighty God, pour out your blessings upon these your servants who have been given particular ministries in your church. Grant these leaders grace to give themselves wholeheartedly in your service. Keep before them the example of Jesus Christ who did not think first of himself, but gave himself for us all. Let us share his ministry and consecration that we may enter into his joy. Guide these leaders in their work. Reward their faithfulness with the knowledge that through them, your purposes are accomplished. Through Jesus Christ, we pray. Amen. Now there's a question for the assembly, and whether you are a member of the congregation or not, you are invited to respond to this question. Dear friends, we rejoice that God provides laborers for the vineyards. Will you do all that you can to assist and encourage these leaders in the responsibility to which they have been called, giving them your cooperation, your counsel, and your prayers. If so, please say, I will. I will. Amen. Thank you, church council. Thank you, officers. Thank you, congregation. Lisa wants to take a very quick photo, so don't move. Um, but uh, so, yeah, okay, scooch, scooch in. And as Lisa is arranging folks, uh, I, I will get ready for a benediction. It's okay. It's easier now than later, so okay. All right, there we go. All right. <laughs> and now, friends, may this, yeah, another round of applause is in order. Yes. You can go down. You can, you can go sit. <laughs> oh. And now, friends, may the spirit that was in Jesus be in us also, enabling us to know the truth, to do the will of God, and to abide always in God's peace. Amen.